todos, todes, bienvenides. Pues estamos de fiesta, la UNAM está de fiesta. Tenemos aquí a una amiga, colega, eh, profesora y eh, pues gracias por acompañarnos, gracias por estar aquí. Y la doctora Frances Rodríguez, la directora de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, mi directora, eh, va a leer la semblanza de, de Judith Butler, para quien no sepa su trayectoria. <risa> Hola, buenos días a todas y a todos. Es un gusto estar acá, como dice Rosaura, justamente, eh, en compañía de Judith Butler, que pues, fue una, una propuesta de, de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras y el Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios de Género. Eh, voy a hablar un poquito de, de Judith Butler. Eh, ella nació en Cleveland, Ohio, en 1956. Es una filósofa postestructuralista, profesora, escritora y activista estadounidense de talla mundial, como todos ustedes saben. Considerada una de las filósofas contemporáneas más influyentes en el área de los estudios de género, la filosofía política y la ética. Proveniente de una familia de ascendencia judía, sus padres estuvieron siempre implicados en política y según ella encarnaban el estereotipo hollywoodense de mujer muy femenina y hombre muy masculino al antiguo. En su infancia y adolescencia, Judith Butler asistió a instituciones hebreas. Gracias a unas clases especiales de ética judía, se acercó por primera vez a la filosofía. Asistió al Bennington College y luego ingresó a la Universidad de Yale. Ahí estudió filosofía. También recibió la licenciatura en artes en 1978 y un doctorado en filosofía en 1984. Como becaria Fulbright pasó un año académico en la Universidad de Hellerberg y posteriormente siguió estudiados de posgrado en importantes universidades en distintas partes del mundo. Sus trabajos e investigaciones se han centrado en el género, la sexualidad, el feminismo, la filosofía política, la ética y la liberación del cuerpo. Su destacada carrera como académica ha transitado en las más prestigiosas casas de estudio en Estados Unidos. Comenzó como profesora en las universidades de Ohio, Washington DC, Maryland, antes de unirse a la Universidad de California en Berkeley desde 1993, donde está actualmente adscrita. Ahí, en 1988, le fue otorgada la Cátedra Maxim Elliot en Retórica y Literatura Comparada. Judith Butler también se desempeñó como profesora de filosofía Hannah Arendt en la European Graduate School de SASFI en Suiza y pertenece también al Departamento de Estudios Psicosociales en Birkberg College de la Universidad de Londres. Como activista, ha participado en varias organizaciones de derechos humanos. Ha escrito libros, una destacada producción editorial, como autora, como coautora, capítulos de libros y artículos. En 1988 apareció su primera publicación destacada, el ensayo Actos Performativos y Constitución del Género, donde explica que el género vendría a ser una especie de acto que uno interpreta frente a un grupo social, un estilo de guión que viene heredado por, las, por la experiencia histórica. Le siguió su libro más famoso, El género en disputa, feminismo y la subversión de la identidad en 1990 obra en la que profundiza más en el género como construcción social. Así lo femenino pasa a ser algo político. Además del género y de la filosofía política, se ocupa de la historia judía y ha profundizado en conceptos como desposesión, violencia e igualdad social. Ha realizado grandes aportaciones a la filosofía política, el derecho, la sociología, el cine y la literatura. Su nombre ha sido asociado a la Escuela de Frankfurt. En 2006 se publicó un doc su documental, Judith Butler, Filosofía en todo género, donde se aprecia un poco de su vida íntima y profesional. No hay una sola, no hay una sola identidad. Yo viajo de la una a la otra, dice el autor al comenzar la pieza cinematográfica. 
Dentro de los reconocimientos y distinciones que le han conferido, recibió las becas Guggenheim en 1999, Lawrence Rockefeller en 2001, los premios Adorno de la ciudad de Frankfurt en 2012, por sus contribuciones a la filosofía feminista y a los estudios de género, y el 33 Premio Internacional de Cataluña en 2021, entre muchos otros. Tiene la distinción eh, honoris causa en nueve universidades diferentes, ahora en diez, porque también es nuestra honoris causa. Eh, pertenece a la Academia Británica desde 2015, a la Academia Estadounidense de las Artes y las Ciencias desde 2019. Fue nombrada una de los 25 visionarios que están cambiando el mundo en 2010. Actualmente es profesora del Departamento de Retórica y Literatura Comparada en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. A lo largo de los años, Judith ha apoyado a los movimientos sociales por los derechos LGBT LGBTQ+, y se ha pronunciado sobre muchos temas políticos contemporáneos, incluyendo críticas al, socialismo, al sionismo, a la política israelí y sus efectos en el conflicto palestino-israelí. Se desempeña en el Consejo Asesor de Wish Voice for Peace y en su Comité para la Libertad Académica y en la Junta del Center for Constitutional Rights en Nueva York. We are glad to have Judith Butler with us, an initiative uh, laid by the Rosaura Martinez and Griselda Gutierrez for the Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, and Marisa Belaustegui Goitia, aquí con nosotros, from the Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios de Género. Thank you. Thank you for, very much for accept, uh, our invitation and welcome. Marisa, eh, perdón, Rosaura. Rosaura Martínez Ruiz, eh, quien va a, bueno, es nuestra eh, profesora eh, de tiempo completo en la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras del Colegio de Filosofía y eh, bueno, fue la primera que llegó a decirme vamos a proponer a Judith Butler para el, el honoris causa, a lo que se sumaron muchísimas personalidades, muchísimas mujeres de la universidad y por supuesto Fuimos en compañía del Centro de Estudios, eh, el Centro de Investigación y Estudios de Género con la doctora Marisa Velázquez y Goita, y le cedo la palabra para que nos hable un poco de la, de la obra y de, de, de Judith Butler a la doctora Rosaura Martínez Ruiz. Gracias. Gracias, Ángeles. Bueno, pues es para mí un honor y un placer poder presentar hoy ante este auditorio a una pensadora y militante política de la altura de Judith Butler. Um, Judith Butler ha formado a toda una generación de pensadores. Su trabajo es un acontecimiento en la historia del pensamiento en el sentido de haber fracturado el status quo y de abrir un nuevo horizonte del pensar. Ha desmantelado categorías como género, identidad, performatividad, ha descrito los mecanismos psíquicos de la exclusión y ha creado conceptos fundamentales como el de lamentabilidad, para referirse al carácter de una vida para ser experimentada o documentada como una pérdida colectiva dolorosa. Este concepto filosófico no solo permite pensar la esfera política actual, sino que dibuja y traza el camino de una posible transformación radicalmente democrática del mundo hacia uno mejor, uno en el que toda vida sea digna de ser vivida. Para Butler, que el mundo haya construido una violenta asignación diferencial de la lamentabilidad, esto es, que unas vidas se perciban como más dignas de duelo colectivo que otras, no solo es un diagnóstico, sino un vehículo ético que nos permite formular un imaginario político de equidad. Se trata, pues, de una aspiración normativa. Judith Butler es también una colega generosa y una constructora de comunidades. Desde 2016 dirige uno de los proyectos más importantes de la historia del pensamiento crítico y de la comunidad internacional interesada en la teoría y las prácticas críticas. 
Me refiero a la creación de un consorcio internacional que ha agrupado y que seguirá convocando a programas, seminarios, publicaciones y grupos de estudio interesados en esta tradición. Este consorcio tiene como uno de sus ejes principales el inaugurar un diálogo transregional para trazar un nuevo mapa y expandir el sentido de teoría crítica. Es hoy una de las voces más influyentes de la tradición crítica, pues le da forma y contenido en un marco global. Las preguntas que ha formulado se dirigen a pensar las nuevas modalidades de la violencia y de dar la muerte que demandan ser reflexionadas críticamente. ¿Pero qué quiere decir pensar hoy en el contexto actual la violencia? Siguiendo a Butler, quiere decir, y la voy a citar en una conferencia que dio en Boloña, asociar el esfuerzo de desmantelar formas de conocimientos, marcos epistemológicos ligados con la reproducción de prácticas objetables de poder, con proyectos de transformación social que buscan lograr metas democráticas sustanciales como la libertad, la igualdad y la justicia. Cierro la cita. No está claro cómo se logra esto, pero todo indica, sostiene, que está asociado con la capacidad de, por un lado, contar la historia y, por otro, de imaginar un futuro mejor. La crítica debe ser una intervención en el curso de la historia que la fracture, para que en esa grieta se abra el horizonte de un mejor futuro. Hoy necesitamos de una crítica de la violencia. Es urgente hacer visibles los mecanismos psíquicos que de manera fantasmagórica e inclusive inconsciente facilitan y operan la violencia sobre cuerpos, comunidades y pueblos específicos. Es imperativo denunciar tantas falsas y peligrosas representaciones de poblaciones para responsabilizarnos y responder sobre los mecanismos de asignación inequitativa de la lamentabilidad. Es inaplazable construir argumentos teóricos fuertes de por qué es ética y políticamente nuestra responsabilidad hacernos cargo de la vulnerabilidad y violencia contra las mujeres, las personas trans, disidentes sexuales, las personas en condición de movilidad, las desaparecidas, empobrecidas, perseguidas políticas del mundo y las comunidades indígenas. Judith Butler los está construyendo nos hace pensar, por dar un ejemplo, en nuestra interdependencia ontológica. La crítica, ha explicado Butler, puede también entenderse como una manera de registrar y responder a una demanda histórica o a un conjunto de demandas. Después del descubrimiento freudiano del inconsciente, del trabajo de Hegel, Marx, Arendt y Foucault, entre otros, la crítica de la razón pura se ha puesto en cuestión. Esto es, el juicio kantiano que termina en la formulación racional de leyes universales se ha mostrado dramáticamente insuficiente. Ni el tribunal ni el juicio garantizan el acontecer de la justicia. Muchas veces, y en México las más de las veces, los ciudadanos no llegamos al tribunal por miedo a represalias o somos víctimas de desaparición forzada o asesinadas víctimas de feminicidio por las mismas autoridades responsables de la impartición de justicia y seguridad. ¿Qué hacer cuando la ley y el tribunal no son suficientes? La crítica debe entonces ir más lejos y convertirse en un modo de vida más allá de la ley, aunque en relación con ella. En estos tiempos de crisis en los que la violencia parece asumir formas soberanas, legales y administrativas y en las que el juicio mismo o bien deviene una forma de violencia o su llegada se difiere indefinidamente, la crítica es obligatoria. Crisis puede entenderse como el fin de una era y el principio de otra, pero ¿qué pasa cuando en América Latina el significante crisis no evoca ni un fin ni un principio, sino más bien una temporalidad indefinida y sin horizonte? La generación X de México, a la que pertenezco, y de hecho de toda Latinoamérica ha vivido solo el tiempo de la crisis, misma que no parece poder ni alcanzar un fin próximo ni inaugurar un futuro distinto y mejor. Pareciera entonces que el tiempo de las crisis tampoco está equitativamente distribuido en el mundo. Este significante tiene en el sur otro sentido, el del tiempo detenido. El diagnóstico de la violencia en el sur no es de situación crítica, sino de enfermedad crónica y degenerativa. No obstante, no puede ser terminal. Debemos resistir este imaginario de la violencia. La crítica de Judith Butler nos enseña el poder político de la imaginación utópica, que no quiere decir Disneylandia, 
La imaginación en tanto estrategia política es la resistencia activa y productiva de nuevos y diferentes lazos sociales. Los experimentos mentales de espacios de cohabitación no violenta que Butler propone, defiende y practica tienen un fundamento teórico y social fuerte y veraz. ¿Qué pasaría si todas las vidas fueran igualmente dignas de duelo? Si todas las vidas fueran valoradas como dignas de protección y salvaguarda. ¿Cómo sería ese espacio de cohabitación? La visita de Judith Butler a México es oportuna y para bien, porque vivimos en un país en el que los índices de desigualdad social son de los más altos del mundo. En México, el 80% de la riqueza se concentra en el 10% de las familias, de las cuales solo el 1% acapara más de un tercero. El tiempo está también injustamente distribuido. Según un informe de la CEPAL, las mujeres en México son las que destinan más tiempo para el trabajo doméstico y de cuidado no remunerado. Las mexicanas dedicamos aproximadamente el 30% de nuestro tiempo en labores de cuidado, mientras que los hombres solo el 11%. Estos números indican una enorme desigualdad de género. Pero no es solo ese tiempo el que en nuestro país está dramática e injustamente mal distribuido. La expectativa de vida en México se acorta en las poblaciones económicamente desprotegidas, la falta de agua, de servicios médicos de calidad o de atención médica a secas, el no acceso a la educación, su mala calidad, salarios que no alcanzan para llevar una vida digna, etc. Todo esto nos muestra que en México hay vidas que, como dice Judith Butler, no se valoran como dignas de protección y de salvaguarda. Hay vidas que en México se acortan porque la protección social no las cobija. México es también uno de los países con el índice de feminicidios más alto en el mundo. Cada día nueve mujeres son asesinadas por su género. México tiene la concentración más alta de población indígena en América y más del 80% de esa población vive por debajo de la línea de la pobreza, dos dólares de ingreso al día. La expectativa de vida es siete años menor en las entidades con mayor concentración de población indígena. La mortalidad infantil es de 2 a 1 mayor. El predominio de las llamadas enfermedades de pobreza, cólera, paludismo, dengue, lepra, etcétera, es también mayor en estas comunidades. Y los desaparecidos en México, que desde 1964 suman más de 100 mil. El 97 de estos han desaparecido de 2006 a la fecha. Entre ellos, los 43 estudiantes de la normal de Ayotzinapa y los familiares de las buscadoras. Hay vidas que en México se acortan porque no son dignas de ser protegidas o salvaguardadas por razones políticas de género, etnicidad y o clase social. El trabajo de Judith Butler es crucial para entender, para dar lenguaje y vocabulario a estos fenómenos de la, vida, de la violencia psicosocial. La crítica nos ayuda a comprender que más allá de las instituciones y las leyes, de la mismísima ley que abre nuestra Constitución y que dice que todos somos iguales ante ella, se juegan mecanismos psíquicos inconscientes y representaciones fantasmagóricas. Lo más peligroso de los mecanismos psíquicos de la exclusión, discriminación y aniquilación es que no son ni conscientes ni racionales. Debemos vigilar, vigilarnos, denunciar, desconfiar de nosotras mismas, sospechar de los marcos epistemológicos con los que hemos sido juzgadas y con los que juzgamos a otros. Es una tarea crítica y psicopolítica urgente para poder construir espacios cada vez más democráticos y cada vez más eróticos en el sentido de complejos y conflictivos, sí, pero no aniquilantes. Bienvenida, pues, Judith Butler. La UNAM agradece y celebra tu visita. Muchas gracias. No hablo español, pero um, hay una traducción, sí. We, they, are, they have access to the, the uh, translation somehow. Okay, perfecto. Um, thank you so much for those uh, wonderful introductions, and uh, thank you all uh, for coming here today. Um, to listen to my remarks. I'm very grateful um, 
to the uh, Department of Philosophy and Letters, to um, Gender and Women's Studies, and all the other people and units who helped to bring me here today. I, uh, I'm quite aware of, of your support, and I feel um, moved and honored uh, by this um, invitation. Uh, when we seek to determine responsibility, we usually ask, uh, responsible for what? <clears throat> but also, responsible to whom? Presupposed is a set of actions, as well as someone who is affected by them. And there is generally an I, a subject, who is asked to take responsibility or who is held responsible regardless of whether or not they accept their own responsibility. We generally understand responsibility to be bound up with prepositions. Um, we are responsible for the earth, or we are responsible to someone, or to an entire group or class of people. And we think of responsibility in relation to failure. In English, we take responsibility or we fail to take it. And I think uh, you don't exactly say tomar la responsabilidad, do you? I don't think sometimes you can say it, but it's odd. Um, uh, we, we say that responsibility is mine. And we can certainly talk about the responsibility of institutions to abide by policies or the responsibility of states to pursue just laws or to protect and empower those on the margins. All that assumes that some set of actions should ideally be taken and that the failure to act in certain ways is a failure of responsibility. And yet, in many of these instances, the subject who takes responsibility for something or even for others, whether human or animal, is very often conceived as an individual. And if I am most concerned with taking responsibility and not failing, then I am concerned, well, with myself, my good name, my sense of having done what I should have, what I was called upon to do. The moral discourse that asks me to take responsibility for any number of issues or people, for that matter, is also the one that can make me more self-centered. More, And this self-concern can become, under certain circumstances, a form of moral narcissism. And the self-blame or self-judgment that holds me irresponsible can become, as we know, a form of negative narcissism, a self-absorbed concern with what I have failed to do. And yet, if we look at our world, whether climate change or femicide, rising fascism and police violence, it is more important than ever to emerge from moral self-preoccupation, to respond to the events as they unfold, and to the kind of world that emerges when those committed to a politics of hatred are elevated and empowered. We rightly feel that we must respond, and we do, but we cannot respond well if we remain within the framework of individualism or if we respond to every moment without an analysis of the forms of power that pervade our lives. When one denounces an injustice in order to show that one is a person who denounces injustice, um, whether or not we are effective, whether or not we are in solidarity with others, then we act only as individuals and our denunciations fade almost as soon as they are enunciated. If my purpose is merely to show that I oppose emerging fascism, that is not quite enough. We will not make a new world through taking moral stances that only fortify individualism 
and take us away from collective action. Am I intelligible? Si, sí, okay. Muy bien, muy bien. Um, of course, I accept that there is a singularity to each of us, as Adriana Cavarero has shown, and I oppose forms of collective identity that deny that singularity, as I am sure you do as well. At the same time, we have to challenge our very sense of discrete selfhood when we come to understand ourselves as living beings related to other living beings and to the living earth that is now threatened with destruction or rather is being destroyed as we speak. We have to let that discrete selfhood be challenged in coming to understand our basic obligations to others as defining, in part, the ethical bond between us, a bond that operates in and as social relationships. I may enter into a contract with you, or I may promise you something, but prior to any contract or promise, I am already in relation to you. I do not start life as an individual. If anything, I become individuated in time, and even that individuation remains a tentative situation. And if you are a living creature like me, as I assume you are, <laughs> and we are living creatures among other such creatures, depending on life processes that constitute the Earth, then already we are in a complex set of relations when we set about to decide how to act and how best to take responsibility. If I separate myself from you, then I decide how best to honor the responsibility I have to treat you well. Then I have already taken distance from the ethical relationship that binds us. If we give priority to this point of view of ethical relationality over methodological individualism, then the way we think about responsibility changes. It may be that I become less preoccupied with whether this I has taken responsibility than with changing the very way we think about living on Earth with other earthly creatures. If our lives depend on each other's lives, then the nature of our obligation to one another changes, as does our obligation to the living planet. <clears throat> How do we make judgments under such conditions? Do we act as individuals when we judge, inspecting our conscience and acting alone? Or are we related to others in the act of judging, responding anew to the circumstances of the world. Most of us who read Hannah Arendt have been concerned with how she formulates judgment, for it is clear that when we judge, we are not simply applying a principle to a set of situations. We are also responding to a situation that often demands that we judge in a new way. We are judging what is right and wrong, justified and unjustified, but our judgment is a response, and it depends on our responsiveness. And although many have argued that the rule of law is what we most need to affirm, they do not always distinguish between the kinds of legal regimes that are worth supporting and those that demand our opposition. When legal regimes become corrupt, or when they are complicitous with the murder of those who are exercising rights of assembly, expression, or protest, then we are surely right to stand in opposition to such laws, to such regimes. And yet, when we stand in judgment of the law, when we, for instance, decide that a set of policies, or in fact, an entire legal regime is a criminal one, and then we have to ask, are we standing outside the law or against it? Or are we sometimes unwittingly 
exercising a principle that has not yet been embodied by the law, but should be. That is to say, in our very judgment, we are exercising a principle that has not yet been embodied by the law. In the eyes of some states, we ourselves become criminal when we challenge the law, when we ask that the law embody justice. If we oppose the law because we have judged the law to be unworthy or harmful or even criminal, we are engaged in judging. And to judge is not simply to show how a specific instance fails to conform to a general norm, but to interrogate the very norms that have defined the field of action and responsibility under the law. For Arendt, such forms of critical judgment were not the prerogative of individuals acting alone. Judgment required a political understanding of what our relations to one another are and what they should be. And judgment is bound up with history, for in the wake of the murderous Nazi regime, there were new crimes, new historical configurations of criminality that were executed by laws in the service of a genocidal regime. And now if we consider the ongoing destructive force of extractivism, the destruction of the earth for the purposes of profit, the rise in violence against women, trans, indigenous, lesbian and gay people, of racial minorities of all kinds, of religious minorities as well, if we consider the way that hatred itself has been elevated to a political position, we are compelled to judge the situation together and in a new way. To judge, to judge the law, is to respond to what new forms of legal power and legal violence there are, and to find forms of collective responsiveness in which we can both think and act together. <clears throat> If we ask, well, where do we stand when we make judgments about new forms of destruction that are affecting the planet, the answer is not just in this particular location where each of us happens to be, for our locations are now intertwined. Each location implies the others. That destruction of the rainforests in one part of the world affects the ecosystems in all parts of the world. We are, as it were, outside of ourselves, and rightly so, when we judge and act. For one acts not just for oneself and one's own history, but for the world in which that history can be told, the earth without which no common endeavor is possible. Whoever we are must be elaborated theoretically and politically. Our historical responsibility is to encounter a changing and ever more destructive world with new practices of judgment, ones that we craft and enact in common. And that fundamentally changes the sense of the common in which we are living or trying to live. For we can only persist as living creatures in this world if the world, the earth, regenerates itself as complex, dynamic, interrelational, and a living set of processes. Where we are positioned is already within that world and outside of ourselves, dependent upon an earth and world that are no longer separable from one another, if they ever were. And this is obviously where I take distance from Hannah Arendt and where she should have taken distance from Martin Heidegger. Um, another story, yes. <laughs> um, it is already as an interconnected and interdependent life that I seek to preserve life. And this means that the I who would hold itself separate and discreet is already failing to grasp the task at hand. When we ask who judges or where is judgment happening, we are asking about all the ways that we seek to think together about our world, about the form that thinking takes when we undertake it collectively. And in line with Arendt, I would say that judgment is a kind of action, 
even a concerted action, one that we undertake in common, and not only in relation to what the common has been, but what it can be. So dreaming and wishing is part of our judging, anticipating a new world, perhaps a new form of law that recognizes our interdependency. For instance, at the end of Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt delivers a judgment against Eichmann, one which she believes the Israeli courts failed to execute properly. She writes, you have carried out and therefore actively supported a policy of mass murder. She is speaking directly to Eichmann in the book. Eichmann's uh, acting as judge, okay, so a fictional scene. Um, Eichmann's final crime is that he acted as if he had the right to decide with whom to share the earth. In accord with the policies of the Nazi regime, he represented those who thought that they could determine with whom to share the earth and who decided that they did not need to share the earth with the Jews. And we should add the Roma, the communists, the gay and lesbian people, the disabled, the ill, and the poor, among others. Hannah Arendt's brutal conclusion is that Eichmann deserves to die because no member of the human race, and I quote, can be expected to share the earth with you, end quote. I do not share her support for the death penalty, but I find her reasoning instructive and it may lead us to a different conclusion from the one that she defended. Let us consider what is, that, what is Arendt doing when she judges in this way. First, uh, she judges not simply as herself, but in the name of the so-called human race. Arendt makes clear that moral judgment is not the same as legal judgment, and even asserts legal regimes should be judged within broader moral frameworks. Significantly, she also claims that Eichmann failed to exercise judgment and holds him personally responsible for that failure. In judging him, she exercises in an, and enacts the very judgment that he failed to exercise. And yet, in the scene that she creates at the end of this book, she delivers a death penalty, thus affirming the death penalty as legitimate and appropriate. When she voices the judgment, she speaks as a plural subject, a we who is invoked at this moment, suggesting that judgment is not simply an individual act, but an implicit or explicit recognition of plurality itself. But what kind of plurality is this? Can we take our cues from her own use of the plural we in this final sentencing? When Arendt says we, when she judges as a plural subject, she is positioning herself as part of a larger humanity. That humanity is plural, which means that all those who are part of it are at once singular or distinct, but also bound together in a living, differentiated and connected way. When Eichmann and the Nazis acted to kill whole populations, they sought to distinguish by their very action between a set of humans with the right to persist on this earth and those who lacked any such right, that is, the right of some to belong to the earth, while denying the rights of others uh, to that same belonging. This demographic distinction was not just a mental event or a written policy, but a set of actions, a systematic form of state conduct, genocidal in nature. So the distinction drawn is also a form of conduct, a social and political policy. The crime he committed was to attack plurality itself. And for Arendt, there can be no human outside to plurality. We have to ask about animals for she excluded them from the plurality she defended. Hence, a crime against humanity is an attack against plurality, in her view, an attack on the very complex and open-ended character of what I would call social bonds. She would not call them social. I'm calling them social. She is speaking with a plural voice, if not the voice of humanity, which takes revenge against the man who has attacked humanity. Of course, 
Arendt is originally writing these lines in a journal and lacks all legal power to actually sentence Eichmann to death. Her judgment is not only plural, but performative. It takes place in an imagined scenario, a hypothetical scene, through a subjunctive voice. In other words, if she had had the power to sentence him, this is the judgment she would have made. She judges in the name of plurality against those who would destroy it, but she is also depending on an imagined scene to deliver her judgment. In some sense, she represents that plurality. In another sense, she is trying to articulate what that plurality can be. She's not unified with that plurality because, well, plurality cannot be unified, and there is no way to fully overcome the singularity of perspective that is hers alone, the distinct way she gives voice to a plural condition. Similarly, she does not let Eichmann stand for all Nazis. She is asking why he failed to disobey genocidal laws, for disobedience was his moral obligation. He should have exercised judgment, exposing and refusing the illegitimate character of a genocidal legal regime. The Israeli courts are also to blame because they speak in the name of the nation, and their trial was a form of nation building. And as Arendt makes clear, plurality cannot be defined by the nation state. In fact, plurality operates as the alternative to both the nation and to nationalism. So the crime at issue is neither committed by an entire nation nor committed against an entire nation. It commits a breakage or rupture with that plurality that, by definition, cannot know nationality, cannot be bound by nationality, and finally ought not to be. To some degree, Arendt seeks to instate a post-national framework for conceiving of plurality, one that would then serve as the basis for legal decision-making about crimes against humanity, a basis she finds nowhere actually instantiated in the law of her time. Judgment here emerges at the limit of law and in the wake of its failure. The we she seeks breaks with the we circumscribed by the nation state, any we that belongs to the nation. Plurality not only names differences and interrelations, but serves as the basis of judgment and the form of its enactment. It is not only the multivalent voice through which legitimate judgment takes place, but a form of concerted action. Regarded as, as a spontaneous and even creative act, judging produces its own principles by virtue of the judging activity itself. And that is, in fact, a quote from her. Judging produces its own principles by virtue of the judging activity itself. Let us note, judging is here a collaborative activity, and it is not one that you or I can undertake alone. As I mentioned, Arendt's um, theorization of judgment takes place at the limit of law. On the one hand, in the post-war years, legal systems left many stranded, who expected that law would be a bulwark against racism and fascism, anti-Semitism and systemic genocide. On the other hand, the courts could not rightly judge these unprecedented crimes precisely because existing law could provide no precedents for these catastrophic events. As a result, judgment must do something other than apply a law to an existing case. It must both imagine and create the principles or criteria that would be able to grasp the crime, but also specify why this crime is a crime against humanity. In turn, humanity has to be thought anew, not on the model of individualism or nationalism, but as an unwieldy form of sociality, what Arendt calls plurality, which makes our lives complex, conflictual, and open-ended. I would add we each approach the common world through a perspective that is invariably upended and revised through its encounter with other perspectives. We do not occupy or defend a position that belongs to us alone, 
or that remains fixed in time regardless of every challenge. Indeed, none of us has a fully informed understanding of the world for an, only an understanding built through multiple perspectives stands a chance of gaining that understanding. To have a point of view to make a fully individual judgment is thus to offer a perspectival and revisable view to enter into a form of public discord that alone can yield a better understanding, a fuller picture. Indeed, the point is not to get the existing world right, to give an adequate account, but also, clearly, it's not just to do that, although we try, but also to criticize destructive power through recourse to an imagined plurality that knows its living character is bound up with the diverse forms of living on Earth. Cavarero puts it differently, noting that democracy emerges through a plural voice, which is no one voice, obviously, but a scene in which every speaker enunciates what she calls a vocalic uniqueness, as well as uh, what she calls a resonance with an echo. Politically, this plurality has to be understood as interactive, and though I emphasize the discord among perspectives that inevitably follows, Cabrero draws our attention to demonstrations and events of surging, insurgent democracy, where she writes, an interactive plurality that expresses its ontological and relational status through the physical uniqueness of single embodied voices can speak or sing in unison, but they are neither absorbed into a, collectively, a collectivity or left isolated in their individuality. What is created, she, calls it, she says, is a common space of interaction and so a positing of political form. In this way, judgment draws on the plurality of concerted action and creates, by its very action, a new space and feel for democracy. I began this part of the discussion by referencing what is living, not just the living character of every person, but the living bond among people and the way that our lives depend upon the living and regenerative understanding of the earth or the planet. Judgment itself is a living activity, plural and unwieldy, constantly faced with an historical world whose shifts demand new forms of political engagement, response, even improvisation. You're still following me? Okay. Many academics from the United States, you know, come to Mexico, and they're like, I began this part of the discussion by referencing what is living, not just the living character. <laughs> right? You know my colleagues. Yes, okay. Okay, I'm gonna have a little more water, if that's okay. Early in Arendt's essay on civil disobedience, she distinguished between the conscientious objector, the individual who refuses to serve in the army, and the civil disobedient. Interestingly, the former is an individual who generally acts on conscience, but the second is actually never an individual. The one who engages in civil disobedience is not one, but also, in her view, is always a member of a group, an organized minority, or even a mass movement. So though we can isolate the individual acts of civil disobedience, those acts establish that individual as part of a group if not a collective, brought together through what she calls a community of interest. Civil disobedience is in its most general form a refusal to follow the law, but that refusal is not my refusal or yours, but one in which we are linked, an action that we might, with aren't call concerted action, a term that allows her to sidestep the more Marxist concept of col collective action. And I should say, she didn't actually pay close enough attention to that phenomenon. Um, the civil disobedient is never a hero, never the one who stands out from the crowd. No, the civil disobedient is the one whose action is not one's own, 
who is already bound to others in and through the act. Significantly, Arendt is not interested in conscience, understood as the higher law found in the internal subjective life of the individual. The kind of disobedience we call civil is one that takes shape in social life and gains its meaning there. Arendt is less interested in moral purity or in the individual's private relation to the law, but then she is in the broader political problem, that is, uh, the world uh, in which a wrong has been committed, the future of the world that is affected by the wrongs that have been committed. In other words, if I ask, what kind of conduct can I live with, then my ability to live with myself becomes the highest norm, and the problem of conduct becomes not only a form of moral purism, but, as I mentioned before, moral narcissism. She is less interested in identifying good, what she calls good men or good humans, since their goodness, if understood as moral virtue, a consistent relation of self to self, always runs the risk of losing sight of the world, even becoming politically irresponsible. She writes that when conscience is invoked by those who wish to practice civil disobedience, they generally act according to rules that are negative. They stipulate actions that one ought not to do, but they do not spell out certain principles for taking action. Arendt goes part of the way in helping us establish another framework. The one who acts in defiance of unjust law cannot act merely as an individual in accord with conscience and still be acting politically. No, that one has to act with others who are acting in the same way, and there has to be a relative anonymity in that action, for it originates in the space between us, in the relationship itself. If several people act in accord with their own conscience, does that make a difference? Yes, it does but they no longer act from conscience, but from their bond with one another. They have forfeited the individuality of their action, not to become an undifferentiated mass, but rather to become a differentiated collective. And if several people act as disobedience, then none of them act from their individuality. Indeed, whatever else civil disobedience are doing, they are taking issue with the social form of individualism. They are refusing heroism. And in this way, they are refusing both a masculinist form of individuality and moral narcissism in the name of political action. Indeed, I think there are many ways of reading Hannah Arendt, sometimes against herself, that expose the risks of military heroism and its masculinization right now. Arendt seems to fail us when she turns to the question of police powers. She insists upon a distinction between criminal disobedience and civil disobedience. Apparently, criminals break the law in ways that radical social movements do not, in her view. She opposes criminal violence and praises police power when she writes, and I quote, criminal disobedience is nothing more than the inevitable consequences of a disastrous erosion of police competence and power, end quote. And yet, can one develop a stable typology according to which criminal and political forms of disobedience are distinguished? One reason typologies like this don't work is because criminality is tactically attributed to groups as one way of destroying their mobilizing powers. The attribution of criminality to a social movement is a tactic that threatens its members with prison or expulsion or police violence. As we know, social movements are often called criminal when they go against a legal regime or its policies. And this means that the very definition of criminality changes according to the tactics of the state and its own acts of censorship censorship and criminalization. We might defend uh, Arendt here, pointing out that she is precisely saying that radical movements engaged in civil disobedience should be treated as criminal. Um, well, um, if, sorry, she, she perhaps huh, we could defend her by saying that she is arguing that such social movements should not 
be treated as criminal, but uh, she gives no account for why that criminalization of dissent and disobedience does take place as often as it does. Criminality does not exist by itself, but only in relation to a specific legal regime. And that is one reason why there is no criminality as such. Of course, don't get me wrong, I'm willing to call certain actions criminal, and probably you are too. But when we do that, we are referring to a legal order, whether an existing or a potential one. There is no criminality outside the law. And yet any critical position taken toward a given regime of law can be called criminal, as we know. And in the end, if every political form of disobedience can be cast as criminal, can we ultimately distinguish between political and criminal disobedience? When civil disobedience is itself criminalized, then the very distinction upon which Arendt builds her case seems to, be, seems to come undone. The problem, of course, is that civil disobedience generally assumes an existing legal regime as its background. It is, after all, the disobedience of certain laws. Etienne Balibar makes the point that because legal regimes require obedience to the law, they presuppose the possibility that disobedience is there and must be contained. Actually, the way Balibar puts it is this way, and I quote, without the possibility of disobedience, there is no legitimate institution of obedience, end quote. Seen in that way, disobedience is required for institutions of obedience to emerge and to make sense. Yet Balibar here stays within a dialectical framework, whereas Elena Luisa Du asks whether we might think of civil disobedience as the emergence of forms of community that are not defined by the state or its laws. Indeed, if the collective action that begins as civil disobedience becomes a way of imagining a future, imagining beyond the temporal and sp spatial horizon of the state and the market, then something different is going on. Similarly, Robin Salicatis um, demonstrates that civil disobedience has been framed traditionally within a liberal model and so fails to grasp the power of the practice, which includes a critique of the liberal model of politics in favor of a more substantial and radical political opposition to social inequality and exclusion. Hannah Arendt remarks that civil disobedience are neither with the law nor against it, but outside of it. It's a kind of provisional anarchism in her view. I quote, civil disobedience arises when a significant number of citizens have become convinced either that the normal channels of change no longer function and grievances will not be heard or acted upon, or that, on the contrary, the government is about to change and has embarked upon and persists in modes of action that show legality and constitutionality are open to grave doubt, end quote. Let us be clear, there are right-wing and reactionary groups that can and do act as civil disobedience, constituting themselves as concurrent majorities. Indeed, she points out that pro-slavery groups committed civil disobedience, dissenting from anti-slavery laws. Thus, it makes no sense to romanticize civil disobedience as if it always or necessarily generates political consequences we want to affirm. And yet it does suggest that forms of association and collectivity can emerge to the side of government, constituting a problem for state legitimacy. The civil disobedient, in her view, is neither a rebel nor a traitor. They have, rather, left the social form of individuality, and in so doing, opened up a space of collective practice and imagining unrestrained by liberal politics and existing legal norms. In their practice, they take issue with legal positivism, which claims that one should follow the law because it is the law. For positivists, most parents are legal positivists, by the way. <laughs> Why should I do that? Because I said you should. <laughs> and then you go to school and you learn that's a very bad form of arguing, right? Okay, don't let them do that. Um, 
For positivists, there is no outside to the law. For civil disobedience, the outside to the law is opened by the refusal to follow the law. It is thus a refusal, not in the name of a higher law, nor even necessarily a better law, but in the name of the community bound together in the act. Not only a displacement of individualism, narcissism, and masculinism, but the initiation of a form of collective imagining that moves beyond the constraints imposed upon the political ima imagination. That is, in other words, that very movement. Further, it is a way of thinking about the kind of reciprocal trust and consent upon which legal orders depend. Where there is consent, there is always the potential of dissent. And Arendt writes that, I quote, all contracts, covenants, and agreements rest on mutuality, and this mutuality binds each member to his, her pronoun, fellow citizens. She imagines the reciprocal action of promising, a form of making a bond with another that establishes the social connections without which contracts and agreements make no sense. This is an ideal moment in Hannah Arendt, maybe even a utopian one, one that seeks recourse to a pre-political community or society without which politics itself is impossible. She writes, this is the only form of government in which people are bound together, not through historical memories or ethnic homogeneity, as in the nation state, and not through Hobbes's Leviathan, which overawes them all and thus unites them. Her point is that people are not bound by cultural or racial identification or nationalism, nor by the fear inspired by state violence, but through what she calls the strength of mutual promises. This account of how people become bound to one another relies on a conception of freedom, for if we do agree to follow laws, we do so, Arendt argues, by virtue of a tacit consent. Indeed, she writes, and I quote, we all live and survive by virtue of a tacit consent. This is not the consent that I give to you or to a set of laws, and neither is it one that you as an individual make. Rather, it is a mutual consent that we give to one another, and this happens prior to any codification in law. It could be said to be the condition of possibility of any such codification. In other words, where, where, whatever freedom this is, whatever form of freedom this is, it emerges between us in and as the exchange, in and as a form of mutuality, if not mutual aid, and it does not have to be vocalized to become binding. In contrast with Gramsci's view that the state manufactures consent and does so effectively, and that a mix of consent and constraint is required by hegemonic state structures. Arendt followed what is called the associationist view, drawing on Tocqueville's account of voluntary forms of association. Now, if we suspect that consent is a counterfeit term, that we only think we are consenting to structures that are co coercively imposed upon us, then we give the state perhaps too much power to determine our freedom and desire. What Arendt refers to as freedom, what she calls freedom rightly called, um, is accounted for without recourse to subjective motives and causality. We cannot illuminate the obscure dimensions of freedom by looking inwards because freedom does not appear in the realm of thought. It requires another medium, that of politics, and specifically in the realm of action. In this way, freedom is worldly, belonging to the sphere of appearance and not an inner reality or a subjective disposition. It appears and operates only in an interrelationship with the world. I quote, we first become aware of freedom or its opposite in our intercourse with others, not in the intercourse with ourselves, end quote. Thus, those who have sought to build a political philosophy on the basis of freedom were right to make freedom into a presupposition but wrong to assume that they understood how best to define it, to define it, uh, variously seeking recourse to inner life or causal sequences or indeed uh, ideas of personal liberty bound up with individualism. Indeed, one of her worries in her essay on freedom is that the very idea of an inner freedom, 
which for her is emphatically a non-political freedom, has predisposed philosophical thinking about freedom in some seriously errant ways. As a result, she spends some time clarifying what freedom is not. It is not an attribute of thought or a quality of the will. And when she first starts to provide the positive contours of what freedom is, she refers to the free man's status, understood first as the freedom to move and the freedom to gather, uh, what enabled him to move, to get away from home, to go out into the world, and to meet other people in deed and in word. In other words, the implicit contrast is slavery or indentured servitude. As a result, freedom first becomes clear in the context in which constraints, the constraints of slavery are thrown off when the ability to act in public first becomes possible. The constraint might be the private sphere where women and the aged are deprived of public freedoms, the prison, or slavery. But in general terms, freedom is first understood as the liberation from a constraint, presumably legal and forcible. And yet, even if that is the story through which we learn about freedom, or even the paradigmatic image of freedom in public culture, Arendt insists that this version does not suffice to understand freedom. For freedom to be true freedom, that is, what she calls freedom rightly called, there must be a common public sphere or space, as she puts it. And that's not to say that all forms of common space are free or that they condition freedom automatically. Rather, wherever we make freedom, we produce at the same time a space of appearance. The principle of freedom is only apparent in the act of freedom, in the free acts of people who claim or make the space for their own appearance. This is what happens when queer and trans people take to the streets with their feminist and cis allies to demand the right to appear without discrimination and violence, to demand access to health care, to demand changes in education and public policy that recognize and honor their rightful place in a democratic society. How do we come to know this freedom in public and collective action? How do we describe it? And how do we distinguish what is truly free from manufactured consent? Well, Arendt writes, and I quote, the inspiring principle becomes fully manifest only in the performing act itself, unquote. In other words, principles are not extricable from their embodiment. They cannot be known in advance. A principle of freedom is not realized in some external form and then vanishes. No, freedom is, in her words, inexhaustible, which means it is open to an infinite iteration of performing acts. Freedom becomes manifest through action and only through action. It neither arrives from a separate domain nor can it be known apart from the action that is its emergence. Freedom cannot be examined apart from its enactment through action. Once again, she makes clear, and I quote, the appearance of freedom like the manifestation of principles coincides with the performing act. As she puts it again, and I quote, the accomplishment lies in the performance itself and not in the end product, which outlasts the activity that brought it into existence and becomes independent of it, end quote. I'm moving towards the end. Philosophers and sociologists have argued that people must first be authorized before they can make changes in this way that the performative act of speech, for instance, is only creative or effective if authorization has already been granted to those who are speaking. But if we are outside the law, even against the law, authorizing one another, just as we were engaged in a practice of mutual promising, what follows? Just consider how we have seen how students gathering together to oppose femicide, how lar large groups of feminists have taken to the street to oppose harassment, rape, and murder, how the indigenous have reclaimed land that the government has stolen, how climate activists have stopped machinery without any prior authorization to do so. The family and friends of the Ayotzinapa 43 in Mex Mexico and all the other people who cannot find the traces of those they have lost, all of these people have gathered without authorization 
held governments and police accountable. They are the people who have exercised collective judgment through word and deed to bring about justice, a justice that has arrived or is arriving still and will surely arrive if we continue to lend our support. And now the young people in Iran race through the streets expressing a freedom that gains its power precisely because it is not authorized. We do not say that that is useless unless we believe that violent state power always wins. No, we see the animation of uprising of potential revolution and no law or state authority gave any permission for uprisings such as these. Do we really want to say that performativity of this kind is useless or fake? No. What, I've answered that question. <laughs> what I, I didn't wait for your answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I've offered here today is a performative account of politics in Hannah Arendt's view. You didn't know I was doing that. One which I believe is relevant for our time. But I would be remiss if I did not point out that reactionary forces have often made use of civil disobedience, breaking the law in the name of their own higher purposes. There is nothing in the concept of civil disobedience that keeps it from being co-opted by political forces that seek to destroy the future of democracy, a future that depends on the materialization of rights and power for all the disenfranchised. We could simply state that in light of these right-wing movements in our times, some of which are clearly fascist, we should adhere to the rule of law. I'm tempted to say yes. But should we not be asking which rule of law and which forms of rule are just and unjust? When we start with the question of responsibility, as I have today, and then move to judgment, we find ourselves in a scene of interdependency and interlocution a way of addressing each other that aspires toward reciprocity. reciprocity. If we judge, that means we, that we are in some sense free, but also that we are collaborating and even experimenting, working with one another. And nothing could be more important in these times as we oppose war and the rise of fascism, as we seek to stop and reverse climate destruction and violence against the marginalized as we seek to find and make solidarity even when we d d disagree or, per or perhaps precisely when we disagree. Um, our forms of solidarity must honor our differences and recognize how generative those differences are. We are looking to enhance our strength as we oppose both state violence and the myriad forms of violence with which the state remains complicit. It makes no sense to think about our collective action as an expression of love or as the working of a single collective mind. No, we will argue, and we must, for there, for there are those who seek to put an end to all open public debate, especially about the legitimacy and policies of the state. But if we let our arguments destroy one another, then we have become the instruments of the very death drive we oppose. So our task, it seems to me, is to live, to think, to act in collaborative and experimental ways, but for forms of life which will be viable for all of us, for an earth and an overlapping set of worlds that will be inhabitable for living creatures, one in which violence is diminished and one day disappears into oblivion. For we live in a time in which we can no longer take for granted the environment that has so often served as the background of our action. No, the living processes of which we are a part deserve our best thinking and action, and none of that can happen without one another. You are kind and patient to listen to my words, to honor my work, and to bring me here to speak with you. I am honored, honored, and I thank you with a full heart.